we are Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation. Uh, our main mission is that we fund high risk, high reward cancer research. Um, and to do that, we identify and enable, and enable young scientists who are brilliant and brave enough to go where others have not. And when you think about our history, we've been around since 1946. And since that time, Damon Runyon has funded around 4,000 scientists with an investment of nearly $450 million. This year, we commit to give close to $20 million across eight award programs. Um, I think the strategy has paid off. Um, for us, we are proud and lucky enough to count um, as our alumni, 13 Nobel Prize winners, 41 Academy of Medicine members, 97 National Academy of Science members, seven National Medal of Science winners, uh, and then 15 Lasker Award winner, winners. And the impact of, that our scientists have on science is immense. So this is a very text heavy slide, but if you look at it, scientists who we have funded have had an arm in three main um, buckets here. So when you think about therapeutic innovation, our alumni have been an, um, a very important part in getting drugs to market. Thinking about technological innovation, our scientists have been on the cutting edge of developing technology such as CRISPR, genome sequencing, and novel computational bio biology algorithms. Our alumni also uh, play a part in starting some successful biotech companies. And so for each of these buckets, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just meant to sort of highlight the overall impact of Damon Runyon um, and that our scientists um, have a huge impact on the field. So who funds us um, and funds our programs? Um, uh, our programs are funded by individual donors, um, individual people across the United States, scientific companies, and elite nonprofits. Um, so 100% of all donations are used to fund cancer research. So that's something that we're very proud of here. Um, nothing goes for overhead. Um, the biotech and pharma companies that fund you, such as Merck, um, understand how crucial your work is to the development of next generation therapies and support us in our mission to fund you. Lastly, elite nonprofits such as HHMI and other charitable organizations such as here on the left, the Mark Foundation also recognize your potential and importance to the community and help us fund the programs um, that, that the, the eight programs that we have. When you think about our award programs, um, they support the entire spectrum of cancer research. So under this basic research area here, we have our fellowship programs for postdocs. We have the Damon Runyon Fellowship Award, which we'll talk about in, in depth today, the Quantitative Biology, and the Damon Runyon St. Jude Pediatric uh, Cancer Research Fellowship. Also in the basic uh, research bucket, which may, isn't uh, a so important to you today. However, as you make that journey into uh, academia and go on and potentially become an, an assistant professor, we would fund you as a Damon Runyon um, Cleft Innovation um, Innovator. Uh, that mechanism funds basic research as well as translational research. And then when you think about investigator-led clinical trials, we have two mechanisms that would fund that, and those are for our physician scientists that are MDs. Um, and so we have the Damon Runyon Clinical Investigator Award, that is MDDO only. And then we have the um, uh, an MD PhD. And then we have the Damon Runyon Physician Scientist Training Award, which is MDDO only. And then most recently, we added a new program, the Scholars Program for Advancing Research and Knowledge. That is a post baccalaureate uh, research award given for one year to recent college graduates, and they can then go and do a year of research in any one of our Damon Running current um, researchers' labs or uh, alumni labs. So not only are we funding the whole spectrum of cancer research, but we're here to support you at nearly every transition point in your academic career. So as I just mentioned, we have a new program for our recent graduates. We have several for postdocs. Um, today, we're focusing on the fellowship award here, but we also have the Quantitative Biology Fellowship Award, the Damon Runyon St. Jude Pediatric Cancer Fellowship Award, and um, as sort of a, a kangaroo grant that when you're ending your, your postdoc, but then starting your new position as an assistant professor, we provide you with um, the Dow 
Damon Runyon Dow Fry Award for Breakthrough Science. Um, and that is an award where if you are a fellow, you apply in your third year. We also fund physician scientists um, and then of course, assistant professors. The idea here is that we're funding early career investigators with pioneer, pioneering new ideas. So for postdoc, postdoc researchers, we have eligibility, eligibility limits on the time that you can be in your sponsor's lab, as well as the time, um, the time since you received your terminal degree. And early investigators come from institutions across the United States. So here in this sort of cartoon map of the United States, we have these darker blue states. Those are current states where we have Damon Runyon scientists. What we're trying to do is uh, ensure that we have Damon Runyon scientists in almost every state across the United States. So hopefully today, this is a way to sort of encourage applicants from, from some of these states where we do not currently have representation. And when you think about the fellowships for um, our postdocs, so we fund postdocs of all degrees. You can have a PhD or a medical degree. And so while the three different fellowship awards vary in slightly vary in the mission and research focus, all are meant to support young trainees so that you're able to take risks and ask the challenging questions that lead to the biggest breakthroughs. Um, some common uh, themes across all three of our postdoc awards here is that um, we are looking for you to apply very early in your postdoc career when you're new to the postdoc lab. We adopt a very broad, um, I think this is what others will touch on later, so I won't spend too much time here, but when we are a cancer research foundation, but we adopt a very broad definition to what we define as cancer research. Importantly, only one application will be accepted from a sponsor or fellow per review session, and this includes co-sponsors. These are for the two fellowship awards, except for the Quantitative Biology Fellowship Award. And then earlier, I mentioned that we have the Damon Runyon Dow Fry Award for Breakthrough Scientists. That is to help you transition into your Assistant Professor Award. And so focusing on what we're focusing on today, the Fellowship Award, we, the scope of what we fund here um, is defined as all theoretical and experimental research relevant to the study of cancer and the search for cancer causes, mechanisms, therapies, and prevention. So I think um, as we, if we have basic biologists in the room, you can sort of make an argument that um, a lot of cell biology intracellular processes could be applicable to cancer in the future. And so that's sort of where we also define um, cancer research. This award is for a total of $300,000 over the course of four years. And here are some important fellowship dates um, to mention. So the application is currently open now on Proposal Central. Um, the application is due March 15th. If you have a PhD degree, we consider you a level one candidate. And so your PhD, PhD degree must have been conferred between September 15th um, 2022 through March 15th, 2024. You must, if you're a PhD degree candidate or a level one candidate, you must have joined the sponsors lab on or after March 15th, 2023. Um, and then here we have some selection meeting dates as well as the earliest start dates for your award if you're selected. If you're a potential um, candidate in the room, but you have a medical degree or you're a physician scientist, we consider you um, a level two candidate. So this is you're a board eligible physician scientist wanting to apply for the postdoc fellowship. And you may apply anytime prior to your initial assistant professor appointment. Um, if, you're, if you are a board eligible physician scientist wanting to apply for this award, you can apply it when you're a postdoc, a fellow, a clinical fellow, and or a clinical instructor. And so, so I don't um, speak too long because I think everyone is more interested in hearing from the um, Dr. Builder and the fellows in the room. Uh, we have an extensive eligibility on our website, so I won't belabor those points here, um, but we do get some common questions. And so I really wanted to highlight those that come up in, a lot in some of the emails that we receive, as well as some of the info sessions that we've given in the past. Um, so, oh, was there a question? I'm okay with questions, Doreen, if you have one. Okay. Um, so um, what this award is meant to do is really have you study something new, make new breakthroughs in a new area. So postdoctoral training in the same institution in which the applicant received their degree is discouraged. 
Um, proposals that are a direct extension of your graduate work will not be funded. And, and then the fellowship awards are meant for full-time research. Also, if you're a physician scientist, um, at least 80% of your time should be put towards Damon Runyon supported research activities. Um, importantly here, international postdocs working in, in US institutions are welcome to apply. And then your mentors are, and institutions are permitted to supplement your stipends um, from uh, your institutional grants or sponsors grants, but they may not um, be supplemented by other fellowship awards or grants. Um, fellows are permitted to obtain additional awards or grants, but those can cover research expenses only. Okay. Some of the other hey, benefits. Megan. Oh, yeah. Sorry, we have two questions in the chat. Um, one was asking the difference between those two sets of dates listed. Um, and those are just our different cycles that are available for the application period. Um, so either in March or in August, and those are the different eligibility requirements for those dates. Yep, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then we have a more specific question about um, someone's dates. If you email us, we can always give you more guidance about your eligibility. Um, and then of course, if you have any question about the scope of your research or you have concerns, you can email us and we can sort of evaluate or set up a call with you to see if it's appropriate or to sort of um, also go over the, the projects that we have funded in the past. If anyone is curious right now, you can go to our website and under the fellowship, you can click on four scientists, go to the Damon Runyon Fellowship links. And we have an area there called current projects. And when you look at current projects, we list every project that we're currently funding for that mechanism. Okay. I think that was all. Um, thanks for bringing that to my attention, Sarah. Okay, um, so some of the other benefits of becoming a fellow, um, if you are a physician scientist, we do provide medical debt repayment for medical school loans. We also provide um, or invite you to an annual fellows retreat once a year. And then there are sometimes the, the opportunities to attend some of our fundraising events, which I think is one of the more glamorous parts of science that as a postdoc working at a research institution, you may not be exposed to. And then lastly, we give a dependent allowance um, per child. Uh, so as an awardee, if you're awarded a Damon Runyon Fellowship, you join a scientifically rich community that offers many opportunities. I think first and foremost, receiving this award, you're given the scientific freedom to explore the questions that you're most interested in, which is, um, I hope that some of the fellows will touch on this later. I think it's very rewarding as a researcher. You also join a, a group uh, with strong mentorship um, that's full of collaboration where our scientists meet to share data and ideas. And then you're a part of a network of top researchers for the length of your scientific career. And so you can contact us with any questions at awards at damonrunyon.org. If you go to our website, um, my email is also on there. It's my name, it's megan.allen at damonrunyon.org. And so here is our awards team. Um, you heard from Young earlier and um, myself and then Sarah but we also have Shannon Donovan as part of the team and um, our chief administrative officer, Claire Cahill. Okay, and with that, I will stop and I'll um, hand it over to Dr. Builder. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, so I'm gonna speak to you just very briefly from the perspective of the um, award committee uh, review panel. And so this is a group of faculty who are leaders in all sorts of areas of biology that are relevant, but again, not exclusively um, filled with people who are devoted only to cancer. And we uh, look at all the applications. Um, we read them all. Um, most, most are read by either two or three individuals. Um, and then we rate the ones that, uh, that we discuss. And so what I want to do in the time I uh, have available is just give you a very brief overview of um, some insights into what that process looks like. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to try to keep it brief so that we have plenty of time for uh, people to ask questions. 
So I'm going to touch on these five points um, that Megan has uh, illustrated here on the slide. Okay, so first of all, it all starts with the proposal. Um, Damon Runyon has a, um, a brief to uh, support brave and bold science. And I love that phrase because I think that's exactly um, what this committee, what the committee looks for um, in the proposals. Um, we're looking for uh, work that's transformative and, 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 and lead, lead to breakthroughs um, using innovative approaches to make really new um, discoveries in biology. Um, you can really think about, uh, sometimes we talk about the wow factor, like, wow, this, you know, I, I never really uh, thought about this question, but this is something that the applicant um, is not only proposing to study, but has a really, uh, you know, well-articulated uh, plan of how experiments are going to address that. Now, um, clearly this, uh, you know, some of these proposals will have a lot of risk, um, but Megan highlighted that as well. Um, you know, as long as the gain is high, um, uh, then the risk is acceptable and, and um, the committee really has a, um, keeps an eye out for those kind of um, high risk, high reward application. Right. We often talk about, you know, what's the upside? If we were to fund this work and everything worked um, as the um, applicant has proposed, how would that affect, uh, you know, our view of, of cancer biology and, and, and biology in general? So really bring us your um, bring us your your best proposals. We get um, applications from people who have you know sterling CVs that are a mile long. Um, but if they're just you know uh, if, if the proposal doesn't um, doesn't excite us, if it doesn't seem like it's going to be transformational, those applications just uh, go nowhere. We're really looking for the brave and bold science. Now with respect to that, um, for point two. Um, the the brave and bold science can really be about a, a, a very very broad swath of biology. Um, Damon Runyon is a cancer research uh, foundation that's supported by donors who want to advance cancer research. Um, but the um, uh, the the foundation itself and the review committee um, have uh, a very um, enlightened progressive view of how we're going to understand cancer. And since cancer is um, a derangement of normal biology and uh, myriad, it's myriad aspects of, of how it plays out in the body, um, the award committee recognizes that it, important advances to understanding cancer as a disease really can come from all sorts of areas in understanding um, normal biology. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, in my last application, in my last round of applications, my favorite application was something that actually looked at anim animal behavior. Um, but in that application, uh, the applicant uh, was able to make a, an explicit link and, and an argument that was, you know, very sensible. They didn't spend half a page on it, but very sensible about how this could inform um, cancer biology. So I'd really encourage you to bring us your most exciting science. Do make um, you know, do make a link to um, cancer biology. Don't send us, you know, just a reformatted version of something you sent to a non-cancer uh, fellowship application. Um, but we really do uh, take a uh, take a, a very generous view of um, how that kind of biology can uh, impact our understanding of cancer as a, a tragic and devastating human disease. Okay, point three. Um, it's important to understand that. Uh, so I, I really stressed that it all starts with a proposal, but the fellowship award is uh, funding the person as well as the project. And so we really want to understand who is the individual um, that we're funding. And what I really tried to give some insight here is that reviewers can find strength anywhere in the application. You know, not only the proposal and not only the past work, but also in the motivation and uh, the history um, and really the uh, the journey that a scientist has taken to um, applying for the fellowship. So your opportunity to do that is to uh, is in the, the personal statement. Um, that's a place that you where you can emphasize um, uh, the distance that you've traveled. Um, you can give examples of your resilience, your drive, your initiative in pursuing scientific questions um, in the past, and then that allows the fellowship committee to really uh, think about how that's going to play out um, in, you know, with the potential of if, if we support you as, um, as a fellow. And so, again, um, you know, letters from mentors are also a place that can come out, but 
Um, what's really under your control as, as applicants is really articulating that um, in the personal statement. And um, again, I, I really want to emphasize that the um, the committee often finds strength in those statements that uh, that um, puts individuals, elevates individuals uh, above what other aspects of the proposal. If, if we were just looking at, um, you know, uh, past performance or and, and the current proposal uh, alone. Um, another aspect that you want to make the most of um, in number four is the research statement. So um, clearly, we you know the the, the we take uh, we we put a lot of weight on what a the performance that an individual has made in the past. What is we want to see ev evidence of the talent and accomplishment of the applicant um, that we can kind of project into the future. Um, but you really want to. Uh, you know, help us see what your accomplishments have been in the past. Um, we want to move past the, you know, just, you know, paper counting or, you know, looking at journal impact factor um, and things like that. We really want to understand what the impact of the work uh, is. And so the research statements gives you the opportunity to put that in context. Maybe you've only published one paper. Maybe it's in a journal that's in kind of a, you know, a, a specialist, you um, uh, 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 area that uh, that is not you know right on my regular reading list, but I want to hear about how your work you know um, changed the game there. What was what was known before? What did your work um, uh, you know? Uh, what was the important question that the, your work tackled? And where is the field now that your work has been published? That's really um, what we want to see. So give us the chance to um, to understand what the impact of your work has been. Um, and then finally, um, when we're talking about uh, there is in in the criteria that we use to evaluate, we also talk about um, the mentor and the, the training environment. So the rationale for this is that we care. We, we know that it's not we know that, you know, fellows um, on, on their own, um, you know, just having a, a great brain and a great set of hands is not enough to succeed. They need to be in an environment where they can be trained and learn to be um, great scientists. So um, we want so we want to support fellows that have every chance to succeed as scientists, um, both on their individual project that they propose now, and to put them on a trajectory for a career where they're going to continue to be successful, um, as uh, Megan kind of uh, highlighted in the impact that the alumni have had. So that's why we we want to hear about the the mentor um, in the environment. Um, Sometimes people feel that um, if you're if you've gone to you know maybe you've gone to the lab of a young PI because that's where they have a new technique or have, have really opened up a new field and people wonder well you know um, that young PI may may not have a track record where they can say they've already you know placed seven scientists in academic jobs. Um, there are ways to um, uh, to help us see that this can still be a great environment for you to train in. Um, one is to encourage your mentor to write a very thoughtful and personalized training plan where they really articulate, how am I going to um, help this fellow uh, you know, succeed both as a scientist and in their career? Um, sometimes if there's a young PI, you can uh, uh, identify a, a more uh, senior or established scientist in the institution that the lab has a close relationship with that can serve as a co-mentor. And that makes us on the committee um, uh, feel confident um, in you know, the trajectory that you're taking. And of course, it's going to be great for your uh, career as well. So I will end there with just those five insights. But um, um, again, I'm happy to answer questions uh, that may come up in the Q&A. But I just want to leave you with the idea that awardees are, are really not, there's no single formula for being a, uh, a Damon Runyon Fellow. It's not, not, these criteria that we apply are not one size fits all. So I really encourage you to um, consider these insights and then just you know send us your best science and an explanation of who you are um, and where you come from articulated in the uh, most compelling way possible. Thank you very much. Uh, and so now we'll hear from the fellows. 
Um, so I'm Nicholas Gergeur, as I said, I'm hailing from the University of Minnesota. I'm a fourth year fellow in the lab of Steve Jameson, and I'm an immunologist by training. Uh, I'm very fascinated with how tissue resident immunity works. And so when I wrote my proposal, uh, I lo uh, proposed looking at how we can modulate tissue resident immune cells uh, in a therapeutic context and also whether uh, the ability of these cells to locally maintain themselves to proliferate over the lifespan of an organism might have relevance to cancer and whether cancer cells exploit some unique mechanisms that uh, resident immune cells also use. So you can already get a taste from that, uh, that I'm not studying something that is entirely 110% cancer, but something that has cancer relevance. And I, I just want to add um, to what David was saying uh, that there have been projects during my time at Damon Runyon that have done field work in Chernobyl that have studied <laughs> cave fish. Um, it's an incredibly diverse group. And I think that's one of the most awesome things about Damon Runyon. And um, in, in terms of, you know, the, the proposal, I spent a lot of time iterating it, getting advice from mentors, getting people to review it, changing it, altering it. And um, just to, to reiterate some points that were made earlier, I think it is very important to think about um, how does your work apply to cancer, but also take a big swing with your ideas uh, when, when you're writing that proposal. You know, I was writing an NIH proposal that was fundable as well at the same time, and it was totally different from the Damon Runyon proposal because as all of us or many of us know, uh, the NIH doesn't necessarily like things that are super, super high risk. Um, but for Damon Runyon, you have that freedom to dream, uh, which is really awesome. Um, so those are the things that come to my mind and glad to answer any specific questions at the end. Hello everyone again, so I'm Claudia. I'm a second year Damon Runyon fellow. Uh, so I think, I guess my background is a little bit more different because I'm I come from Chile. I'm an international uh, fellow. After I moved to France to do my PhD, so I spent there like around five years, and later I decided to come back to the American continent again. So I'm here back. Uh, <clears throat> so my project is also not really a hundred percent. I'm also an immunologist. It's not really a hundred percent related to. Um, to cancer, but I guess that at, at the end you can always link and try to find like something that it might be useful later on for cancer, uh, even like basic science or cancer therapy development or something like that. Uh, I also spent a lot of time uh, writing my my grant. This grant, uh, I had a lot of feedback, of course, from my supervisor. Um, but I I have to agree as well that it took me time. Like I spent a lot of time trying to reach like a, the best proposal and try to go further and try to explore other things that sometimes you cannot explore. So that I would like to highlight as well as uh, the previous fellow was mentioning. Uh, this is like a very broad fellowship. You are not really like uh, stick to cancer all the times. We were just like in a retreat like a couple of months ago and the topics were very, very broad. So I was very surprised. Uh, and I'm, it also make it like as um, Megan was saying, like a very rich community. So we can exchange. We have all, all of us, we have the very different approaches. So we can all of us like uh, try to uh, collaborate and make it like a really like a rich community that's very um, useful and valuable. Um, so I don't know what else I can say. I'm, I I was thinking to also stress the point that it's a, you, you as an international fellow, you can always apply. You are more than welcome. Uh, even like you that you didn't do your PhD here in the US, you can still go ahead and apply because there are opportunities for, for, for people like me, for example, that did the training outside the US. So uh, there are opportunities for everyone. It's just that as uh, <clears throat> they were saying previously, you have to really like take uh, take some time to write like a good proposal and probably you will succeed. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole and I'm going to echo a lot of my um, other fellows comments in what I have to say, but um, I am a biologist by training and a biochemist. And so I also have a project that has cancer relevance, but I'm not doing experiments in cancer cells necessarily all the time. So my project is, my proposal was written studying 
proposing to study DNA damage in the context of chromatin. And so um, DNA damage is important and can lead to cancer, and we often target it with therapeutics. However, my research is looking at chromatin remodelers, so I'm definitely on the basic side of understanding future therapeutics, but understanding how our damage repair pathways occur is really important to downstream cancer therapeutics. So that's all just to say that my project has clear cancer relevance, but if you go on the website, I think it's worth noting that you can categorize the current projects by cancer type. And there is specifically a cancer that just says all cancers. And so that is what my project falls under, where I do not have a specific cancer I can point to, but my project does have the clear cancer relevance. So along with what um, they've previously stated about having bold projects, I want to reiterate that, that this is really a time when you can propose something that maybe your lab doesn't necessarily do. It's kind of outside the realm of your postdoctoral lab. And so for me specifically, I think it's important in your proposal to show how you are uniquely po positioned to answer these big, bold questions. And so that gets back to what David said about your personal statement, that you need to tell the, your whole story of yourself and how your background is leading you to be able to ask these questions. And your training environment is going to help, help you be successful and taking these high risk questions. Also, I'll have with a few more minutes, I'll just mention that being at CU Boulder, I had a concerns when I was applying that maybe I needed to be at one of the bigger institutes on maybe the east or the west coast because we see a lot of funding, specifically NIH funding, going to those big powerhouse research institutes. And so I just really want to say that, as Megan pointed out with our the geographical map, that really it doesn't matter where you're doing the research as long as you can describe that you are in an environment where you will be set up with a mentor and a facility to answer your question at hand. And so I think really they're hoping to expand that to include all parts of the country and specifically show that we can do great science in the middle of the country where um, me and then also I know Nicholas is in Minnesota. So there are a lot of great science happening, not on the coast. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, so we'll stop here and take some questions from the chat, or if you wanted to unmute yourself, you are more than welcome to do that as well. We already have a few questions um, that people um, sent specifically to me as well as um, everyone. So um, there's a, a first question here about preliminary data in your proposal. And so I'm wondering if we can hear the feedback from a reviewer, how you feel about a proposal that's lacking preliminary data and then, or has too much, for example, perhaps. Um, and then if um, any of the fellows in the room um, can talk about if what your concerns were at the same time about preliminary data. Sure, I can, um, I can uh, take that. Um, I wanna emphasize that um, the, I, I don't know, there's about, um, you know the review board is is large and uh, has a very diverse set of scientists. And what I've tried to give you in the kind of the five points I uh, I mentioned is things that I think we all um, would agree on. But reviewers differ on um, dif differ on different things. I think there are some individuals that would um, feel that you know some amount of you know that there needs to be some solid preliminary data to ground a premise. And to make us think that this is, uh, you know, that this is a, a project and an individual um, that are worth supporting, rather than just, uh, you know, kind of a theoretical idea that, um, you know, that sounds great, but it might just be a blue sky idea that it doesn't go anywhere. Um, but there might also be other um, uh, reviewers who are so taken by the way that you've um, framed that proposal and understand that. Um, uh, the eligibility criteria for the for the Damon Runyon you know fellowship are not that you can you know generate um, a large amount of preliminary data to get in. We want the project to be something that is the fellows, not you know the the, the fellows stepping into the lab and just taking the next obvious step that in an already established research program and you know where where the, you know you could already have four figures of um, preliminary data. So um, I think that. Uh, 
uh, you know, there's not a, a, a single answer to that, but that I think gives you a sense of the parameters on which the review panel would um, look at the amount of preliminary data that's shown. Did any fellows have any? Oh, Nicole. Yeah, I was just going to comment and maybe David could correct me if I'm incorrect, but I don't think that the preliminary data is required. And so I do think that um, it's worth submitting an application with your idea. Like David said, you don't know which reviewer is going to read it. And you can also have substantial um, you know, background in the literature to support your idea. And so I think that it all comes down to how you write your proposal and pose your question. And uh, preliminary data can help support that, but um, I think it's definitely has a lot to do with how the proposal is written. Yeah. I can say I did have some preliminary data, um, but I think what was important was to show some exciting data that kind of made proof of concept believable, uh, that this was feasible, um, but certainly uh, just, a, just a relatively small portion of data that kind of demonstrates that it, it, this could work and that it's interesting, not trying to cross every T and dot every I. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so we have a few other questions here. Um, the next two are about reference letters. So we have one um, that asks specifically, so in, in our guidance, we, we, Put that reference letters should be two to three pages long. Um, so any longer um, in our minds is too long for the reviewers, you know, um, and then any shorter, it just seems like um, you would be unfair. It, it seems unfair since the, the bulk of the letters are about two to three pages. And um, if some of our panelists can just comment on um, when you're asking someone to write a letter. So for example, how did you decide who to write? Because we do ask that you have, if you're a PhD, it has to be your PhD, one has to be from your PhD mentor, but then you're choosing other letter writers who are not your current sponsor. So could you just touch on how you chose your letter writers as um, applicants? So I guess I could go here. So. So one of my re recommend like letters of the recommendation come from my previous PhD advisor, of course, but also like from people that I collaborate during my PhD. So some people that I did like really a lot of experiments with, like or other like or the other person was someone that I I had like contact all the time. I was like in meetings all the time. He was like in my thesis committee advisor. So I took those two uh, plus they the require others. Yeah, I will agree. I also had um, a few collaborators write my other letters. And I think what's important here is going back to the idea of funding the brave and the bold. I think that you don't want to just choose someone because you think it's like a famous scientist you met one time. You really want someone who knows you and has interacted with you and can speak to how you make scientific decisions and how you are going to continue to ask bold and brave questions. And so I think that comes back to that main point. And so as a reviewer, um, David, how do you feel about when you're reading um, letters of recommendation? I think I think both Claudia and Nicole hit it, hit the nail on the head, but anything else to add there? No, I just think anyone who can, you know, provide insight to who you are as a scientist and or prevent, uh, uh, provide you know uh, a context and an articulation of what you've accomplished um, so far and, and what your promise is. I think many of the letters we see fall into the categories um, uh, that were mentioned. You know, a thesis uh, committee member who's not the mentor itself, or a collaborator, or an individual who people have run into at meetings. Um, but the you know that that two to three um, lengths is really kind of this, the sweet spot, you know, we don't need to hear a lengthy reiteration of, you know, every experiment and, you know, what was done uh, uh, for the um, for the graduate research. What we want to hear is this individual's perspective on how they see the scientist um, developing and um, and their their talents and skills and their promise. Okay. 
Great. And then there was just one other comment here about what is a blind letter of reference. So in Proposal Central, your letter writers will upload the letter independently of you. So you are not seeing that letter. Um, that's what we mean by blind letter of reference there. Megan, um, can I add one thing quick? Sure, before sure, I please. On? Just to go back to your um, comment about when you're asking someone to write the letter, I do think that it's important that when you're asking them to write the letter, especially if they're writing letters for multiple applications, to add some of this context we just said, that you don't want just a reiteration of what you did in your PhD, that you would want them to please input some of the things that David just mentioned, that like how they feel about your future progress and your impact of your previous project. I think in an email, if you can kind of let them know that's what you're looking for, it can help them write a much better letter. Great. Um, so we do have a question here too about um, applying to both cycles. Uh, so we have two submission cycles for the fellowship uh, each year. Those dates are listed under the application guidelines. And so once again, our eligibility window is quite strict, um, but I'm wondering if, if Nicholas, you would want to sort of talk about your experience in your applications um, since you may have some experience here. So in, in very rare cases, um, if your timing works out, you have the opportunity to submit very early in your postdoc, which you know we were just talking about preliminary data, that can be challenging. Um, so, so I did that. And then in even rarer cases, you can also have another chance to send an independent application again, independent, not a resubmission, a new application at the end. That doesn't happen for most people, but you know, it, it kind of helps if, if your first eligibility is when you've only been in your lab for a few months to, to have uh, another chance to send a, a new independent application at the end. And that, that was how I got funded. Um, it was a much better, a much different application for my first submission you know, when I had just started and COVID was outbreaking. So. <laughs> great. Great. So I think that handles this. Um, we also have a question here that. Um, Actually, so Megan, can I just, um, oh, sorry, yes. I just add one thing? Yeah. Uh, you know, as Nicholas says, that that's kind of an exceptional circumstance. I think the lesson to take away from um, Nicholas for, for most people is um you know, give it, give your application its best shot, yeah. you know, wait until you have one, think about that you have one chance, even if you, you know, temporally might have to, um, we want to see, you know, your best ideas, your most prepared um, a presentation. Uh, this absolutely is not uh, the kind of fellowship where, you know, you, you, you don't get it the first time. And so you, you say, well, if I change the same, or I, I've got a little more preliminary data, to support the feasibility of this. So let me um, throw it in again. Um, Damon Runyon, the, the fellowship award is not set up uh, to do that. So um, figure out when your best uh, application is gonna be and then put your best foot forward. Exactly, yep. And, and we do not give feedback either. So that's something also to take into account. And it's a very different, I think nonprofit funders are very different from sort of the NIH, for example. Uh, Okay, uh, we also have a question here, and I think um, several members of the panel touched on this. So the question comes in about how does um, the institution where the scholar obtained their PhD, how much weight does that hold? And, you know, perhaps you could you could give some feedback about how someone who perhaps didn't go to um, a well-known university, um, how they may apply and, and be successful. Uh, so I guess maybe I'll I'll start. Um, you know, my temptation is to say almost none. I, I I almost never remember that the name of the institution, uh, the identity of the institution, being a factor with any weight at all. Um, you know, it's all really about what has the what has the individual um, accomplished. Um, and so that's where, again, you know, the research statement, your publication record, um, that's the stuff we're weighing. We're absolutely not looking at, you know, pedigree and, um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, that your how well you did, you know, on your college admissions because of you got a good SAT score. Zero. Don't, uh, don't even think about it. 
Um, I can just add on to that. So in my case, I trained at WashU in St. Louis, which is an outstanding place. Um, but I trained with someone who's pretty junior at the time, got tenured towards the end of my time in graduate school. So um, there's also this issue of, do you have to train with someone in graduate school who's super famous and everyone knows? In my case, that was not true, uh, but I did really good science with a really good mentor. Um, so just as we were talking about, I think Megan mentioned um, you can do your Damon Runyon work with someone who is a, a younger scientist, but is doing outstanding things. Um, the same thing is true for graduate school. It's, it's not necessarily about where you trained or who you trained with. It's about, are you doing good science? Are you productive? Um, do you, do you show that potential? Yeah, I'll also just agree with what Nicholas said. I did my PhD at the University of Kansas Medical Center, which is um, in a very small department with a in a brand new lab. And so I definitely think that it goes back to being able to show the impact that your graduate work had on the field and that you did good science. And um, it doesn't matter where you can, you can do good science anywhere. And I think Damon Runyon does a really good job of being aware of that. Um, and so there's another question here. So um, so if you could talk about, um, oops, sorry, just bounced. Um, talk about how you came into your new postdoc lab proposing a project. And so was was there any overlap with, with projects that were going on in the sponsor's lab? And how did you sort of differentiate, differentiate yourself from the postdoc lab that you were joining with the project? Uh, well, I guess in my case, it's like it was completely unrelated, like no one was working in the topic that I bring to the lab or brought to the lab at that moment. Um, <clears throat> but I also would say that um, this is like a good opportunity to start thinking about your future. So when you are writing this proposal, it's also like, what do you want to do in the future after your postdoc, if you're going to stay in, in academia? Because I guess the majority of the fellows that are applying to this fellowship, they want to stay in, in, in academia, right? So I think that it's like a good option to start thinking, okay, how I want to differentiate myself from the lab that I am in? And also how do I want to like manage my paths like in academic records to try to after like move forward and move away from your lab and have your own research line. So I think that it's like a good opportunity to start thinking about that. Um, I think that it is, I uh, like all, all of that, it's very important to think about, you know, what, what do I want to do in the long term? Uh, but there's also this room for, you know, dialogue uh, with your mentor. So when I interviewed here, I said, I'm really interested in doing this. And uh, my mentor said, oh, that's interesting. What if we also did this? And the ideas kind of bloomed from there, kind of building on my interests, but that dialogue of ideas that's so important in science. Um, and so I, I kind of have a differentiated space. Um, you know, it's very much something that I'm interested in continuing, um, but also with benefit for my mentor, because that's, you know, part of the reason for working uh, with great scientists to have the great exchange of ideas. What I will say is not good um, and is when, you know, you just have an, an idea, a project that is entirely your PI's grant, where they give you the idea and you write the proposal off of that, because I think it will be apparent that you know this isn't necessarily your idea that that you came up with that you deeply understand uh it's regurgitating someone else's ideas i, I don't i don't want to speak for damon running but i think that generally that that kind of comes through in the review process and if david wants to he can speak to that yeah i i would um i would endorse uh you know what nicholas said i think you know there are other applications there are other funding agencies that um support that kind of work and uh we certainly you know, if you look at the the individuals who are the current fellows and the past fellows, you know, not everybody is a solo actor or a rogue agent, you know, doing their own thing in a lab that's unrelated. That's not really what we're um, what we're looking to fund. What we're looking to fund is this kind of like um, um, self, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a it's a project that an individual is really passionate about because they have that kind of self um ownership and 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 their it's their, their own excitement that's driving it and they've identified an environment and a mentor that's going to be supportive and a, an outstanding place to do it um 
structurally, the way that that comes out is uh, the uh, mentor is asked to, you know, basically describe how much of their proposal um, has the uh, has the applicant uh, written. And so, you know, if it's aim three from the from the applicants, uh, sorry, from the mentors um, grant, the, the you know the mentor is not going to be able to say that you know the the individual wrote the majority of the proposal, and it's not just you know counting words. The what it's meant to are, mean is you know ideas and 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 the genesis. So um, I think that that's how that's how the evalu that that's how that's evaluated. And as Nicholas says, we you know we can really tell if if something is um, uh, something that the uh, applicant has really embraced and is really, you know, pouring their energy into for the application. And then that gives us confidence that they're going to do it um, as they uh, continue the science with Damon and Lennon support. Yeah. And then one last question here uh, related to collaborators. Um, so do, have any of the fellows on the panel, did you apply with collaborators and did they propose a letter and sort of what, how did you decide if the collaborator letter was uh, required or not when you were submitting? Because uh, collaborator letters are not required as part of the application. You are welcome to submit them if you, if you want to though. How I have kind of in the past thought about letters of collaboration as being different from like your letters of recommendation is kind of goes in what we were just saying about like pushing outside of your lab's expertise. And so I've kind of used them in the past as like, if we're doing something that no one in our lab has expertise on, then the letter of collaboration can speak to the feasibility of me receiving training in that specific area that my lab maybe doesn't have. And so I think that's one way that they can be used successfully by showing that you will have support and maybe maybe not like a full co-mentor level, but you will have be trained and it's feasible for you to do what you're proposing. Um, but that's just one way to think about it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in the last couple of minutes, um, I think I can summarize what our panel talked about. So um, Damon Runyon funds the brave and the bold. We're looking for um, early career scientists at all levels um, or postdoctoral levels, especially for this uh, mechanism, um, who have pioneering ideas. And so when you're writing at an award to Damon Runyon for the fellowship, um, I think, you know, to sort of paraphrase Nicholas, make it different than an NIH application. Um, we're really looking for the projects that excite you, but are are founded in um, a strong rationale, a strong hypothesis, and have that scientific rigor. Um, because some of the projects are so risky that our fellows um, propose, reviewers like David really look to see the track record of the person applying. And so to look at the, the track record of you as a scientist, they're looking at all parts of this application, your research statement, your personal statement, your CV. Um, and so, for example, um, you know, uh, a couple of the fellows touched upon here. We're not necessarily looking for you to train within these coastal elite universities, but you know, training, having a very strong basis in training um, and doing very good science and showing that at each stage in your career, you were able to contribute to the field as a whole. Um, did I leave anything out? Okay, great. If we were unable to answer your questions, please email us at awards at damonrunyon.org. Um, all of our, or my um, email especially is on our website. And um, I want to thank um, Dr. David Builder um, and then our fellows as well. So thank you so much. And um, we're, we're very happy that you were able to join us today. Good luck. And I look forward to reading your proposals. <laughs> great. <laughs>